2012 Ironman program. Good morning, nice to have you here. You've already achieved quite a bit by finding Malta. There are, you know, there's a story that uh, about 500 years ago the, the Turkish Sultan sent a fleet to Malta to capture Malta and they bypassed us, they didn't find us. And the way to deal with that was to go back and in true, I think, civil service fashion told the, Tur the Turkish Sultan, Malta does not exist. Malta York. But you know that we exist and it's nice to have you. Nice to have you here. I'll, 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 I'll be as short as possible and I just want to share one central, one central theme when we're discussing here the blockchain and education. Blockchain is not going to solve any problems in education and it's not going to change education. We have to solve problems in education and we have to change education. Uh, uh, it would be very comfortable for us to shift the responsibility onto technology to do the work for us. Technology does not have a life of its own. Whatever happens and whatever technology does, somehow, somewhere, there's a human being responsible for what is going on. So, I think this has to be clear right from the very beginning. It's not the first time that we've heard reflections about, you know, where is technology taking us? I think it should be the other way around. Where are we taking technology? And the issue that we need to raise is this. How are we going to use blockchain to, you know, to have a better uh, education system which works for our, for our societies which, are, which works for our, for our countries. Yesterday I was talking, I found it very interesting, I was talking to a, a lecturer at our university. She lectures in uh, health sciences, she, she lectures um, students who want to become nurses and uh, midwives. And she told me that uh, uh, the University of Malta is going to be involved in a very interesting project with other six universities in the United Kingdom, the Netherlands and Norway. And they are seeing how to develop good practice and develop new resources from this very interesting, to share knowledge and skills in spiritual, compassionate care. Now here we are talking about a caring profession and these universities feel the need and those of us I'm sure that we have personal anecdotes uh, which will support this view. Here we are having a caring profession, having to introduce in courses, in professional courses, credits about spiritual, compassionate care. And once upon a time, we used to take this for granted. You know, this is a caring profession after all. So, how come we need to do this? And I asked her, sort of uh, quietly, provocatively, I said, well, but, uh, why, why do you need this? And she said, yes, we need that. Because through the introduction of technology and more technology in healthcare, we've lost the human touch. Patients talk about it, they feel that they are, that the technology around them, <clears throat> it's, it's not as if it's there to help them and support them, but it's as if they are part of the technology. <clears throat> and the human touch is, is lost. And I think this is a very important point that we must keep in mind, that we need the different layers of technology and whatever we're talking about, we have to break through to human beings. We have to keep in mind that after all, whatever we're doing, we're doing for human beings. That technology is there to serve us, not the other way around. This might sound so obvious and so banal, but I think it's a point, it's a point worth, worth making. 
about 134 years ago. Uh, Robert Burns coined the famous phrase, man's inhumanity to man. And if we look at what has happened in the last three centuries, and technology has helped a lot to make man more inhuman to man. Today we have the comfort and luxury of killing at a distance. And uh, after, after Vietnam and the, all the efforts were made to keep cameras away from the killing fields, uh, wars have become video games practically. When you talk of targets and you have, you know, nice screens to show that the target has been hit and, uh, you know, there was some collateral damage, uh, nothing is human, you know, uh, it's, and killing at a distance doesn't disturb us because we don't hear people crying, we don't see blood, we don't see the effect. Now, we have to be careful that uh, we might find it very convenient to say, well, but that is the military, it's the military application of technology. But we have to be careful that the same thing does not happen in other areas, including health and including education. So, and especially, I think, after, and this is, again, yeah, you might not agree with me, but this is, I think, also a, res a result of the enlightenment, which, which, you know, said, you know, religion, tradition, morality isn't the way of progress. That, you know, we, we have to move on, we have to be scientific, we have to be technological, and, you know, not care about these old-fashioned things like morality, values, and, and then we know what that has landed us in. I'm not, definitely, I'm not... Uh, making uh, a bit or appealing that you know we should we should take away all the all the philosophical achievements i think also of the of the enlightenment getting us rid of the obfuscations and the obscurity and the and what we had before but to do away with values you know without thinking of you know, what values should lead us and guide us in our technological projects and what we do uh, has landed us in, in huge, in huge problems. And we must say that technology, again, it's not that technology is evil or that technology is good. It's how we use technology and we must not allow technology with us getting away from our moral responsibility to be accountable for what we do. Because again, today, it's, it's so easy to say, oh, this is not my responsibility. You know, we have diluted responsibility. It is shared. I'm doing this, this bit. My responsibility is this bit. Uh, I'm not responsible. If, if at the end, okay, as I said, long distance killing, uh, we don't see our victims. But long distance policy making is like shooting missiles from afar and we don't see our victims. And it's important that uh, we keep in mind that there might be victims at the, at the, at the end of what, of what we're doing. So, uh, I think it's very important to keep this human perspective in, in mind all the time. And as we make policy and as we implement policy and as we use technology as part of what we're doing, we ask ourselves simple questions, where do we want to go, what do we want to achieve, what do we want to do with this, and to what extent does technology help us, help us get there. It shouldn't be the other way around. Um, you know, as I said, first thinking of the technology and then thinking of education, and then somehow down the line thinking of our students and our people. Because I think we should be thinking of our students and, our, and persons uh, right across, right, <coughs> right, right throughout. And, uh, and then ask the questions on how technology can help us. I'm sure that blockchain technology can help us and not help us only at certain moments in our educational experience, but throughout. Again, we can use it as a force 
for good. But we have to design it in that way and we have to see what, what we want to do. Of how we're going to help our people and not just as a buzzword, you know, go through meaningful lifelong education. And obviously one of the biggest problems that we have is uh, formal schooling and formal education uh, takes time to catch up with reality. Uh, if it ever does, and usually it doesn't. Uh, and that is why it's not enough to think that we can solve our, our problems through formal schooling only. Because most of the time, uh, in formal schooling, we don't have time for education. You know, we don't have time to ask questions, to discuss, for deep learning, to, to see what we're doing, because uh, especially the systems which are based a lot on on testing and exams and that exams uh, get through the syllabi and you know uh, allow allow the system to have a life of its own disconnected from the needs of children disconnected from the needs of young people disconnected also from from our needs so we need to work to get formal schooling right as I said uh, we can't have any blind faith in technology doing that for us, it's really you know, working on, on the policies that work for our children <coughs> and whatever we say and whatever rhetoric we use, children tend to have the weakest voice in the educational experience, there are no unions to, to defend them, there are I mean, hardly ever do they go out on the street to protest, so they don't grab the headlines um, you know and, and the biggest problem we have is that we allow institutional inertia and logistical problems to lead our policy making so it's not asking what do our children need but how is this going to disturb our teachers how is this going to disturb our timetables how is this going to, to what impact is this going to have on our budgets all those are important and it's important to have obviously teachers with us in what we want to do. But we know that ultimately we want to do this for our children, we want to do this for our, for our young people. So we need to get that right as much as possible. Be aware that formal schooling can only do so much. Give, I think, a lot of importance and we must create uh, new experiences in non-formal and informal learning. I, I, I honestly believe that non-formal and informal learning can save formal schooling from itself. The more, the more we contaminate education with reality, the better it is for education. Uh, we cannot have it as a parallel universe uh, and the purest it is away from practicalities as if it's like some kind of superior education, which is not the case. Because ultimately what we want to do, you know, give the skills and values, and values. Because we talk a lot about competences, we talk a lot about skills, but we also need to talk about values. And, and there are ways of doing it that uh, things do change. And believe it or not, even OECD now is talking this kind of language. Uh, you know, developing the financial crisis and the other problems that we've had uh, recently and the big changes that we are facing today and even with what is happening on the European continent uh, where we're finding it difficult to live together. At least now we've started, I mean I, I can tell you that as a Minister for Education uh, attending Council of Ministers meeting in Brussels, the first time we started talking about values was after the Chancellor affair after the, you know, the killing that took place. Because before that, we were all only talking about competences, knowledge and skills. And employability. Now, I would be the last person to talk against the need for connectivity between education and employability. Because I happen to be also the Minister for Employment. So, that's, that's in my interest. But, I mean, we cannot have education simply education and employability, without also education, employability, citizenship, skills, yes, competences, values. As I said, the OECD 
Finally, it's talking about formal education, which brings together knowledge, competencies, character, and recognition, learning to learn. So, at least even there, things are things are moving. And I'll just end on one of my preferred quotes. Some of you have already heard me use this, but I don't mind using the wise, simple words of Pope Francis. I'm a great fan of the book, though I'm not a church lover. You know, he said, we need to educate minds, we need to educate hearts, we need to educate hands. Bringing together, you know, how we think, you know, knowing, doing, being, you know, as, as human beings, and living together. A blockchain plays a role in that. But, you know, the panorama is much bigger than, than blockchain. It, it's there to make us do what we want to do. At least, if not to create a better world, to make this hell a bit more habitable. Thank you very much. Uh, okay, um, we may need a mic up here at some stage because besides the first question, which was how many hours of sleep did I get last night, which is exactly three, okay? Um, so there's, there's some questions coming in. Um, do you want to have, you know, would you like to handle some questions now, Minister? Do you want to make and stay with us for the whole session? All right, so why don't we put the minister on the... On the... All right, so this guy's a busy guy, all right? So can we get a mic over here so the... And so I can answer some of these things. So people are putting on the spot here, okay? So first question, we can get the one. Okay, we just, when I'm at such events, I get the impression we're always addressing higher education. Where, where does blockchain education stand in primary schools? I think saying, you want to Yes, um, that is also a problem, that even in education itself, some sections of education are more equal than others. Because in higher education we give of importance, we, the rewards are there, but it's obvious that we cannot think of higher education on its own and disconnect us from the rest. So when we talk of life and education, we should do what we mean, in the sense that today, you know, a child can kinder, middle, I mean, kinder, primary, middle, secondary, post-secondary, tertiary, and after, and lifelong. Blockchain should have a role in all of this. And one way that I think blockchain can help is to have a personal narrative of every student. From the first early days of schooling, because one of the problems that we have is that even the different, you know, the different phases of education are not connected to each other. Blockchain can help to connect those. Okay, I delayed it because it didn't work out. Okay, um, one use case for blockchain education credentials is increased labour mobility across Europe. Would you agree? Well, of course, and and the important thing is that the person is owning his or her own uh, achievements and not you know not being dependent on the institution to to give that to give that. To give that those credentials. But the work needs to be done, obviously, to communicate among different countries so that, that their recognition is, is mutual. So, the human factor is always there. So, it won't happen on its own. Okay, so this question from Dr. From, from he said, a coincidence or on purpose? So, this conference about technology and education, as many educators, policy makers, and stakeholders, but very few technologies. Nothing wrong with that. In fact, it should be like that. We are the monsters, then it should be our slaves. With respect to our colleagues from learning machine. <laughs> that's just a provocation. That's a true bit, but that's, that's a provocation. No, we should, we should work together. But, but, the purposes and the main aims, the goals of education should be supreme. And the technology is there to make those aims and those purposes happen, not the other way around. Okay, let's speed on. Okay, somebody, somebody replied to one of those saying, I think also vocational education 
adult education will benefit a lot as they're very fragment, fragmented today. Yes, not only fragmented, but they are considered inferior, which is ridiculous. How can we increasingly make visible and ensure the trust of non-formal and informal learning, including also the learning for vulnerable groups of people? How many hours do you have? Well, that's why I said, there I think blockchain can help. So that, because if, if, that's why I said formal schooling is not enough. Even if done accidentally, formal schooling is not enough. We need to support, support with what is happening in the family, with what is happening uh, in society. And also what is happening outside formal school hours. And there are things which you can only learn outside school. You don't expect school to replicate what happens in reality. At most, I mean, at most in school we teach students not to drown in a bathtub. We don't teach them to swim in the rough seas. They will only swim in the rough seas and not drown if we throw them into the sea. And the schools are not big enough to have rough seas. So we, we tend to domesticate reality as much as possible in our schools. And if, if reality intrudes too much, the problem is not our system, but it's reality. And the reality has a, is very stubborn, and somehow or other it always stands up. So you know, that's why I said we need to contaminate education with as much reality as possible. Okay, I'm going to speed up now because I'm aware of time, and, and people are getting used to using the keyboards now, so they're going to get more questions. Okay, so it's, it's going to be a real issue here. Okay? So we learn the same. Mr. Barto, what's your perspective of, on connected learning? What does connected mean to you? And uh, another question, do you see potential joining up connected learning and labor mobility in one's life? Yeah, that's why we're prepared to launch and definitely help us. Because, uh, and it's already connecting us, and um, connectedness between learning and labor mobility is that you go along in your life, and when you need to upskill yourself or reskill yourself, you have the possibility of doing it. Mostly, in most of our countries, what we have now, the formal education system, right from early education to university level, is still the 19th century, not even 20th century, it's still a 19th century reality. Uh, if we say that it has to be lifelong and that we have to keep on risking ourselves, you can't expect people to leave work and say, we're going to do three years now. No, you, you can do short courses which are, or short programs which are very focused on what you want to do, and you accumulate them, and it should also be possible for you to take different programs from different institutions and not have one institution monopolizing your professional development and your learning, and you depend totally on it. You, you should be able to choose what you want to do. And we should also, I think, give dignity to professional progress, not just academic progress. Because, uh, I take it for more than I'm being self-critical here, our reward systems, in terms of scholarships, in terms of financial schemes, even the one where we launched yesterday about tax, uh, no tax, I was going to say tax evasion for a year. Uh, uh, the word was different, that if you get your master's in a year, you won't pay um, tax for one year, and you do your PhD, you won't pay tax for two, for two years. We should extend that also. Uh, we are doing it, but we need to do it more. Two professional programs, so, you know, industry recognized programs. I, 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 I do not agree with those who say that academic programs or so called education programs are inherently superior to programs that are recognized by industry. Now, if, if we say that education is superior to training, where is that? How is that reflected? We need to show how that is reflected. Keeping in mind what I was saying also before, that employability and skills is not enough, but also values and also you know, critical thinking and, and the ability to also reflect about what you're doing and not simply following, uh, following orders. Okay, and um, do you want to take one more or, or are we done? I mean, the one thing about Slido is it's remarkably democratic. So if you upload, you get the top question up. The trouble is if you keep on asking questions, you never stop. 
So if you want to take the last question, which is, given that soft skills are so critical, how relevant is blockchain unless it can capture these as well? Can it go beyond convenience? Yeah, this is where, I, I, as I was saying, blockchain can help, where technology can help, is that if, if in formal schooling we reward testing, and, you know, if you get things right, now in life, you're not going to get things right all the time. And formal schooling inhibits us from making mistakes. We are punished if we make mistakes. And the best way to learn is actually to learn from our mistakes. Because what we know, what we can try, we look at it from them. So it's important that blockchain should help us capture what we learn in non formal and informal learning. That's why I said it, it can give us the personal narrative of what, of what we are going to do. It's not the first time that I've visited workplaces and managers show me young people and they tell, you know, they tell me he or she is the best person we have here. And formal schooling has discarded that young person and said, you know, uh, it's not good. I mean, always fail that, always fail that, that uh, you know, the exams. And then we find out that this young person was dyslexic and the school did not, uh, you know, did not cater for, for that, that uh, learning difficulty. So that's why it's important to have, and I think that coaching can help us there. To, to capture uh, this, this reality, which is definitely not captured in a piece of paper which just gives you the marks of what you did, how you did in maths, in English, and whatever. Okay, I think we're done with that session. Okay, so thanks, Mr. Okay. <laughs>